And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. The Bible says they worship the host of heaven. They built a great tower under the heavens with the idea of worshiping the angels, the spirits, in the heavenly places rather than the God who created the heavens. As it says in the first chapter of Romans, they wanted to worship and serve the creation instead of the Creator. And so God gave them up. It says when, this is Romans 1, beginning about 21, it says, When they knew God, they would not glorify Him as God, but they came vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, and therefore God gave them up to uncleanness, to dishonor their own bodies among themselves, because they wanted to worship and serve the creation instead of the Creator, who is blessed forever. And that was the great degeneration of the primeval world after it had been purified at the time of the great flood, and Noah and his family were only the only ones left to repopulate the world. And the descendants of Noah, for a time at least, stayed true to, to the Lord. But those that were descended from Ham and then later from Japheth did not, and they were the ones who participated in this great rebellion. And in that rebellion, of course, God stopped that by confusing their languages. Now, it's interesting to trace out the scientific study of languages and where different languages came from. There's no evolutionary explanation for the origin of language. Evolutionists have no idea how the barks and grunts of animals might have somehow been able to evolve into the intelligible, symbolic, abstract speech of human beings. Or they try to do this, they try to teach chimpanzees how to speak and so forth, but uh, they can't work it out. In fact, let me read what Dr. Noam Chomsky says. Now, Dr. Chomsky is not a creationist, he's an atheist and a Marxist, but he's probably the world's leading linguist, and he said this, human language appears to be a unique phenomenon without any significant analog in the animal world. He goes on to say that there's no way to bridge the gaps between animal noises and human speech. It has no better explanation than the fact that God confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. A very recent article and book by a man by the name of Colin Renfro, who is professor of archaeology at Cambridge University, one of the top archaeologists of the world, uh, has a book, and I'm quoting from his article summarizing the book, called The Origins of Indo-European Languages. Here's what he says, the archaeological evidence makes it clear that Anatolia was not the only region in which early domestication took place. Anatolia is a region around Mount Ararat, over in that part of the world. The zone of origination of agriculture had at least two other lobes, more or less self-contained regions within the larger zone. These were the Levant, a strip some 50 to 100 kilometers wide, on the Mediterranean coast of what's now Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, and the Zagros region of Iraq and Iran. In other words, the Bible lands around Ararat and Jerusalem and Babylon, these lands where we can point out also we have the center of the earth's geographical land masses, this is where early civilization developed. And this is where as, they, as the linguists try to trace back the, what they consider the evolution of different languages to find the mother tongue as they call it, they find it all tracing back to Babel just like the Bible has said all along. You can depend on the Bible to have the true picture Evolutionists are trying to work it out without re reference to the Bible or to God, but they inevitably have to come back to uh, the record that the Bible has as the only true picture. Well, all of this mythological system, uh, which uh, we find in Babylon and in Greece and in Rome and in Egypt and in Persia and India and all the other ancient nations, it's very interesting to, to note that all of them have points of similarity and commonality. And this is reasonable to expect because they all came from the same source at Babel. And if you think back what would have happened there when they couldn't speak to each other anymore, God confused their languages. They had to separate and each little family group could only speak to itself and so they had to develop their own society. And so some went this way and some went that way. Some stayed at Babylon. Nimrod and his family stayed there apparently. Developed the great civilization of Sumeria. Others went into Egypt. Some went way out to the fringes, and they were the Neanderthal tribes, perhaps. It died out. Others went over into China and wherever else. They separated, and for a little while, each group had to live off of the land, a well, hunting and gathering sort of culture, but that was only a few generations until they could develop enough of a, of a population to specialize and develop their own culture. And that's the way the different civilizations and cultures and nations finally developed. You have the early nations listed that way in the 10th chapter of Genesis. 
Dr. William Albright, who is certainly one of the greatest archaeologists of all time, said that the table of nations in Genesis 10 is an astonishingly accurate document. There's nothing else in all literature comparable to it in terms of delineating the original nations of the world. They tell us that man grunted language into existence. But who are they? Scientists. That's right. Not linguists who actually study and specialize in language for a living. So are you going to take some paleontologist, zoologist, or anthropologist theory for human language development from people who know nothing about it nor study it? That's not logical. So before I get into why it's impossible developmentally, neurologically, mathematically, and statistically that language cannot arise on its own, ask yourself, why would man even wait hundreds of thousands of years before using the same skills of today to record history? Speech is a fundamental part of evolution. Even Darwin himself said speech is 95% plus of what lifts man above animals. So no one can say that language has nothing to do with evolution. It most certainly does. And linguistics requires intelligence. Where did that come from? Language as a code only comes from intelligence. What I have noticed from studying stochastic models is that human language could not have arose on its own, and the numbers required for it to have don't come even close to telling the real story. I'm not talking about communication. I am specifically talking about human language. Keep this in mind. Epoch 1 has nothing whatsoever to do with geology, paleontology, or time. It is a period used to denote the transition from a non-language, Epoch 0, to language, Epoch 1. An epoch is a period that represents a state. Epoch 0 has no grammar, and therefore no language. Epoch 1 is the first use of grammar, and accordingly the use of first language. The period between Epoch 0 and 1 is not a day, a week, or a year. It is any period of time. It is the gradations which require for the transition between the states. That is why it's called an epoch and not a year. After reviewing all possible stochastic models associated with the age of complexity restraints of human language acquisition, it is clear that there were not enough people and that human mental development could never have allowed humans to invent language. These models are what helped me determine this information to be a fact that no evolutionary theory nor debate can get around. I will get into more detail, but for now I think the first important lesson is on the Markov process. It's far more important to help you understand how this process can be used to show transitions between states from no language to language, which are epochs. Now, draw two circles side by side. In the left bubble, put the letter A. In the right bubble, put the letter B. Your bubbles represent states, state A and B. If we further define these states, we can say that state A represents an epoch of no language and state B represents an epoch of language. We begin with our entire population of the world in bubble A. They can only move to bubble B if they can pass the burdens associated with the age of complexity constraints which are based on more than 250 years of medical, psychiatric, and linguistic observations. At epoch zero, there aren't enough people in bubble A to overcome the burdens that move people to bubble B, and this number is not even remotely close. There are a lot of definitions in math associated with the full explanation, which I will elaborate a little bit on. But, I do not want this to be boring or get lost on you. So, in a nutshell, it is a population problem where language cannot arise on its own. There weren't enough people at Epoch Zero to overcome the burden of the constraints. And the people don't get to graduate to Bubble B for free. They would have to overcome and pass the constraints. If there weren't enough people to overcome the burden at Epoch Zero, then language is not a byproduct of nature. If language is not a byproduct of nature, then language came from somewhere else. If language came from somewhere else, then evolution is false. And because it only takes one piece of evidence to falsify the theory of evolution, I have done just that with this irrefutable evidence. I guess the next best way for me to describe this model is by looking at the multiple cases of feral children who are totally neglected, isolated children as well. Specifically, I want to look at Jeannie Wiles' case because I find this one the most interesting. Using Dr. Eric Lindbergh's and, and Professor Suzanne Cutress's work regarding the age of complexity restraints of language acquisition and then applying the data to a small world population, hint, all world populations were considered small until agriculture began, then it forms an infinite no language loop 
from parent to child to parent to child over and over and over again. There are no natural exits for this loop. Studies have found once a human is in the loop, they are trapped. There aren't enough people to overcome the statistical burdens. It's not even remotely close, even in a large-scale population. If it wasn't even in the ballpark, then I would give it a consideration. But it isn't, and that means there is no natural path to language acquisition. One would need a population size that is sufficient to meet the burdens that are imposed on the population. Language came from somewhere else, and it seems nature had nothing to do with it. You see, you were raised normally, which means that you were provided with language stimuli, and you met the standards for language fluency before you turned five years old. The defining difference between language acquisition L1 and the second language acquisition L2 is that the age of the person learning the language. For example, linguist Eric Lindbergh used second language to mean a language consciously acquired or used by its speaker after puberty. Language is only learned for L2. L1 is not learned, it is acquired. And there is a huge difference between learning a language and acquiring a language. Genie was a prime example of that difference. We are not talking about communication again, we're talking about language. You can use your L1 for the rest of your life to learn new abstract concepts or for graduations to learn new language, L2. That is not the challenge. Before there was language, there was no language. The challenge was not to get primitive man to use L1 or new abstract words. Primitive man was like Genie, no language at all. She had no L1, nor did primitive man. Dr. Eric's challenge would have been to create grammar, because none existed. You can't compare primitive man challenges to your ability to use your L1 to learn new abstract things. I have noticed that from all the research, that abstract words cannot be learned after puberty, because abstract concepts cannot be understood or learned. That information, I have gathered, comes from the work of Dr. Lindbergh and his book, Biological Foundations of Language, and more than 250 years of medical observations into all these studies have proven what I am talking to you about. Let's say today you wanted to prove that human language can evolve and that it can form from nothing. What you would have to do is take every human being in the world and put them together. Now take everybody over the age of 13 and remove them. Now you're left with the people that are, have the ability to learn human language because anybody after that age cannot grasp and learn the abstract concepts to learn language. So wolves do not have a language. They have primitive communication skills. Fish do not have language. They also have primitive communication skills. No professional linguist would say that wolves or fish have a language. To classify as a language, grammar must be present. Wolves and dolphins, for example, have no grammar. Even my friend's bird, who can pronounce words, again, has no language. Only humans have grammar. So we know fish, birds, primates, and wolves can't talk about yesterday or tomorrow or the past activities or future activities. They can only make sounds about current activities or base nouns. Only human children possess the ability to learn grammar for L1. Adults can then take their knowledge of L1 and use translations to learn L2. But no language-deprived adult can ever learn grammar without L1. If a person has been deprived of language from the age of 13 years of life, then it's over. Another study has found that anatomically speaking, macaques are perfectly well-equipped for human-like speech, even compared with a human. When stimulated, monkey voices sound flat and gravelly, but the words are clear and comprehensible. Then why can't they speak? Because their brains are not the same as ours. We were created different and in the image of God, and God taught Adam. And all of the observational research that exists just helps prove this point. This is a fact. Since observations and study began in 1644, not a single case of a child over the age of 13 has ever been able to learn language. And that is not based on some creationism or religious belief. This is all based off medical observation over the past 250 plus years, based on all accepted criteria for falsifying evolution theory by professional scientists this problem beats that criteria, because for evolution to be true, there had to be a natural path to everything that all species possess. 
Knowing all of this, imagine now the idea that propagates today that all humans unconnected worldwide all managed to form language independently and roughly all at the same time without knowledge from one another. As is obvious now, that theory is obsolete. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.